Good morning ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately we haven't been able to fix this graphic but we will try again next week. Hopefully we'll have better luck. Well what happened last week? Ah, nothing much. We ended up minus 12. The trend is very shallow. So basically what is happening as you can see here it goes from slightly positive to slightly more negative to back to you know slightly less negative it really isn't exciting um, and this gives you this very flat appearance here in the uh, in the price and also in the moving averages uh, this is probably going to last a while longer before he makes a dash for the hundred or the minus 100 line you can see what happens when there is a trend it goes you know it, it really goes a lot negative or it stays a lot positive uh, very high numbers or very low numbers this is basically saying there is no trend whatsoever deviations are absolutely saying the same thing aren't they look how the uh, these uh, Bollinger bands are coming in um, it's unlikely basically that we make new highs and really this 28 20 30 area is going to be extremely good support for quite a while um, you know this is also the time 16 blue angel I'm not going to bother to show it to you again and this is the time 17 blue angel we're stuck in between the only question is how many attempts we have on the downside and that will depend on uh, various numbers that come out uh, but I really at the moment think that we are in a battle between yield uh, and equities are basically uh, cheap on dividend yield and the market perception of future earnings i.e. are we going to go into a recession or not because if we are going to go into a recession the E part of PE uh, is likely to collapse and then the floor opens up um, so it's just not something that we have data on at the moment because just because manufacturing is weak and that is one of the uh, you know the, the less important sectors of the US economy uh, that does not make the whole index collapse it just makes uh, for sector rotation so having seen the index let's have a look at the others well here we are we have energy energy is in a clear downtrend at the moment isn't it but even that is going to be very very well supported not very far away from it where it is uh, if we have a look at IYZ, the telecoms, same story really. It's not going to make new highs, but it's also very, very well supported here. Uh, the one that is in certainly an uptrend without any doubt is the utilities, which tells you that bonds are staying strong. And XLB materials... Uh, you know, you would have thought the materials would be collapsing far more, but they're very well supported at those levels where we had the 28, 25. So even they are not that bearish. If you look at uh, XLK, this is the one that's most telling you that nothing at all is going to happen here, um, which is a bit frightening because everything is coming in my experience is that when everything comes in at some point something big happens uh, but are we at that point no we're not uh, so um, really the low volatility trend should continue for quite a while and every time you see the spikes in volatility at 19 20 percent it's time to sell it um, even XLF which uh, you know is now showing some signs of life it, it's just not coming down the yield curve is steepening and that is helping XLF so if XLF is one of the large sectors is not coming down uh, what chance has the index really got of breaking that 2825 level almost none um, XLV which is one of the you know it should be one of the uh, weaker sectors you see came into the green straight back out uh, that's the kind of thing you should be trading 
uh, you don't have to ask me. Every time it's in the green, yeah, buy some, you know, a small position, job it for a couple of percent. You know, a couple of percent on, you know, a few hundred contracts, it's, it's, it's very nice. Um, and here we are, have XLP. Now, if this market was going down, XLP uh, would also at the very least stabilize, but it's still in a quite decent uptrend. And that is what yields do. Every time yields come down, makes XLP more attractive. So XLY, this is the one that really needs to break because the US consumer needs to start giving up for the bigger sectors to follow it. Is it giving up? Well, it's not very healthy, but it's not giving up. It's basically saying that there's a real flaw here at 2825. And if we're going to bust it, it's going to take quite some trading, uh, quite some time to achieve it. So basically, I think it's going to be another week of, um, you know, last week was exciting insofar as we thought something was going to happen. I was very doubtful. And this confirms to me that I think we have several more weeks of sideways trading. Well, the trend last week in the bonds was definitely one of yield curve steepening. You can see in this two year chart that we absolutely came off 30 basis points and closed on the lows of the week, having bust through the previous low. Wasn't expecting it. Nobody was expecting it. Nobody was really expecting the uh, number for the PMIs that we got. So what next? Well, I think that whatever happens now, 160 roughly is going to be your high. Very unlikely that the market is going to bust through 160. And I fully expect at some stage uh, with some more weak numbers, to get the 116 to 126 area. You can see that this is this area that we spent so much time in back in 2017. Quite likely to get there. I was always saying, you know, 130 would be my level, this kind of level in the um, in the two year that I thought was probable that we would get to. Well, we're getting to it. I love the fives. I mean, what a beautiful trading range, you know, we have here. Uh, do we go to 117? Uh, I think probably, um, you know, in the next few days, 117 and then stray back up. It, 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 it's a beautiful trading range. That's all there is to it. You can uh, almost with impunity be long down to 117. So, um, you know, there's not a lot to be said. That the, the fact that the five years is right on top of the two years suggests that the market has got the bit between its teeth and that basically the Fed is going to be forced to cut again in October, which is something we weren't expecting. And that is why equities rallied, because they saw that the yields were coming down and staying down, and therefore they were more attractive. Um, it's a tug of war, which is going to take quite some time. Uh, and I'm talking about weeks to... Um, to untangle itself. I think the big surprise of the quarter, of the fourth quarter, could be actually how little net change there is. Tens. Tens I would actually leave alone, simply because they are at a very crucial level against Bunds. Um, and here, look, I mean, we are at all time lows just about. I mean, what is that? Um, 10, 10 basis points away from it. The yield curve is steepening. So why make it difficult on yourself by having a position in tens? Go for the twos and fives. It makes more sense. Uh, if the tens break and stay below these all time lows, we'll revisit. But it, to me, makes more sense that the Fed wants to normalize the curve. I mean, if I was at the Fed and I was going to cut at this stage, I would cut for one reason only, and that is to normalize the curve. The curve is ridiculous. Uh, it's at a, it, it, it's in a shape where it suits no one. It doesn't suit the Fed. It doesn't suit the banks. Uh, 
nobody wants it where it is. Uh, it's all weight of money making it go there. But if I was the Fed, I'd want to normalize the curve. Not much change in the bonds last week, simply because the data was, you know, very minor. So what did the bond do? Nothing. It went sideways while the 10-year rallied. And that gave us, you know, a bit of a uh, weaker dollar. Still, the level is all important. Around minus 40 is the level that you want to get in. I think the odds of the uh, market breaking minus 40 are very low. And at some stage, I think when the, uh, when the Bundesbank starts buying long uh, bonds, of which there are absolutely none out there, we are likely to break that minus 75 level to the consternation of absolutely everyone. Right, well, 10 years against bonds, whoopee, um, it, right at 210. Now, this area between 210 and 20, you know, 200 is going to be very, very difficult to break. Very difficult indeed. I uh, This suggests to me that you don't really want to be long of 10 years anymore. Uh, you want to look for backups in uh, the Bund and buy it. I will show you the Bund uh, in a moment, but it's this tells me that basically the help that the US dollar had, uh, I mean, the, the, the help that the Euro has got against the US dollar by this, uh, by this move in yields is probably petering out. At best, we have another 10 basis points having moved 20. So very soon, it'll be time to get out of this and look for it to come back towards 225. Well, what to say about the dollar? Every time, you know, we approach and we stay for a few days down at these levels of the lower Bollinger Band, we get some kind of event which makes it go back up towards the middle. And that basically gives us this shallow trend. Uh, what makes the trend shallow is that the market never stays long enough at the lower levels of the Bollinger Bands to really open them up. And basically you get a series, a series of squeezes like this, always at lower levels, some at higher, but then lower again, i.e. a very shallow market, which almost is trendless. Um, <laughs> You know, we, I think we are, as I showed you, I think we're coming to the end of the outperformance of tens over buns, in which case, you know, the, the dollar doesn't have that many, uh, that much uh, downside, i.e. upside in euros. But I'm beginning to get worried because, um, you know, these shallow trends tend to have some very nasty reactions at some stage. So certainly, if we uh, see that 107, 30, 40 area uh, that, we, uh, that we have a weekly gap in uh, and we fill that gap, I think it's time to uh, get out and reevaluate. The chart of the Dixie, I mean, says it even better. And now we've got one, two, three drives to the high. You know, it, it, it's... It's very disappointing. I thought there would be much more impulsion once we broke these levels. And what are we? Um, you know, a percent and a bit. Uh, you know, it, it's okay. Call it two percent, but I mean, not you know, two percent of the highs. But that is not the stuff that trends are made of. Uh, you know, we've got everything is flattening out. Nothing can stay. Had the market stayed up here for five, six, seven days, we would be opening up that Bollinger Band and be ready to go, much like we did here. But it's not happening. Um, let's not try and force trades. It's a trading market uh, with 97.87 as the first level that you buy it at. Um, it, let's not try and force it. It's it, it just not going to pay. Gold basically reacted to the bonds and to the dollar. Weaker bonds, weaker dollar, higher gold. And But the it was an impressive, wasn't it? <clears throat> it's um, not basically all it did is, you know, bounce off very close to the very important 1458 level that I would love to have bought, uh, missed. Uh, so 
you know, all it's done is gone back to the uh, period 200, uh, 200 moving average. This is 300 minutes, which I love in the short term. Uh, so it's not really doing very much. If we have a look at a daily chart and we um, see what that looks like, it's still, you know, is it carving some sort of a bull flag? Well, possibly, but I think we are so far away from the 200 day moving average that, you know, a bit more time here would certainly not go amiss. I would love to, it to see, because the positioning is definitely slightly extreme. I would love to see it, you know, do something nasty to someone. I would doubt it because here you have the MACD, uh, you know, we got to, uh, you know, we were very overbought. Now we're very oversold. So let's keep an eye out on gold, especially since my view slowly, slowly on the dollar is beginning to turn simply because it just isn't making any, any headway. Uh, bonds are basically uh, going to be stable for the time being um, because we are definitely in an easing cycle. Uh, the question is, is it a steep curve or less steep? I, I would definitely prefer to see a steeper curve. So gold is definitely not a sell. Uh, it's a question of where do you buy it? Uh, do you buy it at 1450? Does the market let you buy it at 1450, 3, 4, 5? Uh, does the market even let you, you know, um, come in here towards the 1400 area in the 200 MA? I doubt it, you know, I doubt it. I think the next dip, you buy some calls and uh, some longer term calls and you hold them. It, it's unlikely that uh, you are, big, simply because the bonds and the, um, and the dollar are both saying the same thing. They're not going to be against gold. And therefore, I think the, uh, the likelihood of gold performing quite well in the fourth quarter are quite high. Well, we've had uh, almost, you know, nothing in terms of uh, the time passed this month. Uh, and already we have an incredible monthly candle, don't we? You can see how uh, important is going to be to close above 28.64. The upside, it's still 30.60, you know, it, it's not, it, it's 100 points from here. That's all you can have. You can be as long as you like and you are not going to see much more than that. But if he closes up there for two or three months, we, we, we're going up. But never mind, that, that's besides the point. What I'm trying to say is that the market had better hold up because if it doesn't and we break this 28.25, which I think is going to be very, very hard to do, it has nothing until you get below, I don't know, 25.40, something like that, th which is this candle here. When, it, when those levels break, when this center line breaks, it's just air and it goes down fast. So, of course, we'll be watching this, but I think any dip down to 28.65, you still stay long. I think those are still the, uh, the odds that you play. On a weekly basis, we are playing ping pong. We're playing ping pong between 28.64 and 29.52. Um, you know, it <laughs> beautiful. Uh, wish I traded it properly, but there you go. Um, it's going to be very, very hard to break these levels. And you have, you know, you, you have this uh, added support, which is going to be absolutely huge. Whatever you buy at 28.64, you're bound to see again. Um, so, you know, it, it's, a, it's really a tough one. Uh, all you know is that it's not going higher than 3,060, 3,070 because you have the monthly, the weekly, the day, all the Bollinger Bands in the world up there. It's not going up there. So basically this is, you know, the title of, uh, of the video. It's the yields versus the probability that earnings collapse. Uh, at the moment, you know, you don't have definitive proof that earnings are going to collapse because, you know, we do only certain sectors of the economy might be slightly recessionary. That doesn't mean that uh, the majority of companies are feeling it. And therefore, you know, the E is 
quite solid at the moment and the yields take over and basically make the ball bounce up again. So I wouldn't get too bad up at any level here because there's just no reason for it. If you start closing below this, yes, but until then, absolutely no. And this is what I've been saying for quite some time. NQ is just losing, um, you know, it losing its leading abilities. So if tech doesn't lead, if these big growth stocks don't lead, uh, where's the market going to go? 77.88, we still didn't close above it. You know, it, it's, we weren't way out of the Bollinger Band. We've come in. If now all we do is go three-fourths sideways, we'll, we'll come back down here and test the 200-day moving average. You know, when was the last time we t tested the 200-day moving average in NQ? Well, here it is, you know, August. Uh, you know, it, it, it's just not the stuff rallies are made of because, you know, a market which repeatedly tests the 200-day moving average is a market which at some stage is going to give up the 200-day moving average. So, it, you know, still plenty of time to go. It's not going to happen next week. It just, I, I cannot get excited about the market on the upside simply because NQ can't lead. And I can't get excited about it on the downside simply because bond yields are keeping it afloat. <clears throat> now, if my view is correct and yields for the time being, lower yields, uh, win out over... Uh, over the uh, potential of a recession, um, you have to say that realized volatility at some stage has to uh, converge with implied volatility and that basically volatility is too high. If you look at what the market actually did last week in this bar here, we closed exactly where we opened, right? I mean, because what was the net change in um, in in the market in 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 SPX? Not even ten, but you know, what was it ten points? Um, so SPX to me has very little upside until the economy starts firing again. If the economy starts firing great guns, <laughs> you know, then it's going to have the problem that yields are going to go higher, and all the people who bought the wrong sectors. Uh, because yields were going low, are going to have to liquidate those and buy something slightly more aggressive. And the first per place you will see that will be in the NASDAQ, uh, because people will be buying those stocks again. Uh, but you're not seeing that, okay? The NASDAQ is just not rallying against the S&Ps. If you have a look at the performance of QQQ against the S&Ps, it's, you know, it's exactly the same. And you're assuming much more volatility risk in uh, in QQQs. So until that starts happening, to me, volatility is a sell. And you can see here that really basically you should trade between 2030 and 1170. If we now have a look at a uh, at a daily chart, and here it is. The 200-day moving average is actually, you know, sloping down. So when this market starts breaking the 1650 area, it could come off to, you know, to this area very easily around the 13s and even come down and, you know, fill these little gaps that it's left everywhere. So to me, you know, fall is going to be 15, 17 effective trading for quite some time which tells me that yes you're going to have dumps in the S&P because some piece of data comes out but the trend there isn't one. If the US is going to be boring for quite some time is it time to look at something like Nikkei? Uh, it could be. I've been showing you that chart of the uh, SPY over EWJ the past couple of weeks simply because it's doing something which hasn't done in a long time and that is trading below the 200 day moving average on the spread. Now if you have a look at what Nikkei is doing, Nikkei has actually last week came back and retested 21,100 
where the 200 day moving average is trying to break up and get its golden cross between this 50 day in blue and this 200 day in uh, in mauve it, it's you know I, I i would definitely buy uh, some calls in nikkei because the potential is there to outperform uh, if we have a look at a longer term chart you know the these weekly uh, this is a, a weekly chart these weekly moving averages the market is is now staying above them is it going to be a quick thing no but do we have potential to go to 24000 uh, and higher i think we do i think we can definitely say that we we are in some sort of a uh, channel here can't we uh, we definitely have support from the Bank, uh, Bank of Japan in terms of buying. Um, it's definitely a market which is, to me, beginning to be slightly more attractive. The thing that I like about it is that nobody owns Japan. Um, you know, everyone is underweight Japan. And at some stage, uh, they'll come back to it. Uh, it. It can be a foreign exchange thing. It can be anything you like. But to me, the risk reward of being long of Japan here is slightly better than being long of the States. Now, would I put a lot of money onto it? No, but I would definitely have some because it could pay off quite well. Uh, you know, it one two percent of your portfolio if you have absolutely nothing in japan take it out of the us and put it in japan why not i think your downside is very limited well the bias is for next week you know the two-year note to me is the one that's going to be the most interesting because the yield curve should steepen any backup in the two years uh, it's a decent uh, trade to uh, buy calls in it or uh, to get long because I think this 113 to 116 area is going to get uh, targeted at some stage as you see the fives the 117 level is possible so uh, that is the area that I would concentrate I would leave the tens alone and if the bonds get anywhere near minus 40 it's probably a gift uh, SBX, well, you know, what is there to say? 29.52 is definitely the swing level. You know, above is good, below is bad. Uh, 28.64 on the downside, absolutely key. I don't think you break that in a hurry. No way. We really need a lot more data to determine whether we are in a recessionary environment or not. And even then, uh, what we do is we get a steeper yield curve and that helps XLF so it's going to be you know very very hard to break 2864 and stay below it to me that means that volatility needs to come down um, because realized volatility will tend to um, to uh, come to equalize with uh, implied and that means any uh, move up to that 19.2 uh, level is a sell uh, and I'm short of volatility and I keep on uh, saying that one should be short of volatility. The one which is beginning to be worrying is DXY. Um, you know, it. I would not now start saying that it's impossible that we break back above the 111.08. We shouldn't do it, but I think the odds are increasing with this very shallow trend that we're doing some sort of a wedge and at some stage we break it. So, and the next dip, I'm gonna, you know, book quite a bit of profit and, and you know, get out of the way. Thank you very much indeed and tweet you on Monday.